I'm pulling my driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for the drive to work. Okay, so the last four podcasts, I've been talking all about Throne of Eldraine. I think I have one more podcast than me. Uh, so we are. Uh, I left off at multicolored. So last uh, we had talked. Let's see, where was I up to? Um, I think we left off with Calyx that we talked about last time. Okay, so let's start with Dalakos, Crafter of Wonders. Okay, so it costs one blue red. So three mana total, one of which is blue, one of which is red. It's a 2-4 uh, legendary creature, a merfolk artificer, um, and it has the following ability. Um, okay, so it's tap, add two colorless mana, spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or, ability, or, or activate abilities of artifacts. Equip creatures you control have flying and haste. Um, so the idea here is... Um, it is something uh, most of the set cares about uh, enchantments, uh, but we have one one. You you do want a few cards that are a little uh, a little off theme in the sense that um, you do want a, a, occasional things like just say for example someone comes to your set and the thing that's your theme they're like eh, I'm not sure you know you want to have a few things in there for people that might not be uh, so let's say you're just not not up for enchantments okay. Uh, here's we, we throw your bones one. This is the one artifact carrying spell. Um, so basically, what this thing does is it produces mana. So blue and red are the two um, colors most associated with well, blue, red, and white. I guess are the colors most associated with artifacts. Uh, but blue and red definitely does. They're the the inventors. If I like, you see, is it for example are all the inventors. Um, so anyway, it produces mana that you can use to cast and activate artifacts, and then it also encourages you to play equipment because it, uh, equipped creatures get two abilities, a blue ability, flying, and a red ability, haste. Um, and so this is just something, something, you know, it's, clearly this was made, it's legendary, so this was made as, I think, as a potential commander. Um, like I said, it's not something that is super thematic here, although um, the idea of inventors and stuff, there, there is a lot of, um, that does show up a lot in Greek mythology, so the, the source material does have a lot of invention. Um, we're just playing up the idea of uh, enchantments from a mechanical standpoint make a lot of sense here, and we've sort of Theros is the or one, I mean, hopefully ho- I mean Urza Saga was the other one, but uh, at least it's the world that people associate with enchantments. Uh, Urza Saga, we called it the artifact blocks and made broken artifacts and said, hey, look at the enchantments, and no one did. Okay, uh, moving on, Devourer of Memory. So uh, Devourer of Memory is blue and black, so two mana total. <coughs> One of which is blue, one of which is black. Um, uh, and so it is a 2-1 creature. It's a nightmare. <coughs> Hold on one second. Let me, <coughs> let me get some water. Ah, sorry about that. Okay, so it's a 2-1 nightmare um, for two mana. And uh, whenever one or more cards are put into your graveyard from your library... Um, Devour Memory gets plus one, plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. One blue, black, put the top card of your library into your graveyard. So the idea here is that whenever you get milled, uh, so it, since you're playing a blue, black deck, odds are you're milling yourself, uh, it gets bigger. Um, so every, so and if, it's for every batch of milling that happens, meaning it says one, if one or more cards get milled. So when you milled, for every batch of milling, it gets plus one, plus one. Um, and the idea is, um, for three mana, one blue black, you can put a card. You, you can sort of self-trigger itself. So obviously, you put this in a deck that cares about graveyard as resource. You're milling yourself. There's a bunch of ways in the set to care about that escape and other things. And then this card itself, every time you mill, gets unblockable and gets bigger. So instead of two one becomes a, a three two unblockable. Now you can act this multiple times to make it bigger. The unblockability doesn't stack, but you can make it bigger if you want. Okay, next. Enigmatic Incarnation. So, two green, blue. Uh, it's an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another enchantment. If you do, search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to one plus the sacrifice enchantment's converted mana cost, and put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So, what this does is it turns enchantments into creatures. Um, and it turns into creatures that are one bigger than your enchantment. 
Um, now be aware if you're playing enchantment creatures, you could funnel through enchantment creatures, or you can play some combinations of enchantments and creatures. Um, but this is messing around. Uh, in space we've done before, but normally when we've done in the past, it's been creatures going to other creatures. This lets you turn enchantments into creatures. So you can get enchantments, get value of those enchantments, and then later, after you have less value out of them, you can then turn them into creatures. Okay, next. Gallia of the Endless Dance. Red-green, 2-2, two, two, legendary creature, satyr. Haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random. If you do, draw two cards. Okay, so, first off, people love the art of this card. Uh, she is, Gallia is a very happy satyr that is definitely uh, about to uh, have fun. And uh, so the idea is this is a satyr lord. This helps your satyrs. Um, we haven't done a lot of satyrs outside of um, Theros. In fact, have we done any? We might have done one or two. Mostly they're from Theros. Um, but we made a bunch of satyrs in Theros. They're, they're red and green, so it makes sense she's red and green. Um, one of the things we like to do, like you notice, for example, um, we'll have usually every set will have some larger tribal themes, um, but we like doing one-ofs. Like, this is a good example of, hey, here's a satyr lord. If you want to go make a satyr deck, whether or not, I mean, it's legendary, so you can make a commander deck, or you can just make a, a you know, a modern slash pioneer deck. Um, and you can go get all your satyrs, put them together, and then it's something that sort of encourages you to make that deck. Um, and we like making lords for various creatures. They don't always have to grant plus one, plus one, although a lot of them do. Um, but just something that encourages you um, to sort of, to, it encourages you to um, just make a deck that maybe you wouldn't have made otherwise. Um, I, I think that is um, quite valuable. Okay, next. Hactos the Unscarred. Uh, red, red, white, white. So this is four mana, two of which is red, and two of which is white. Legendary creature, human warrior, 6-1. Hactos the Unscarred attacks each combat of Able. As Hactos enters the battlefield, choose two, three, or four at random. Hactos has protection from each converted mana cost other than the chosen number. Okay, so this is top-down Achilles. So in Greek mythology, Achilles was a mighty, mighty warrior. Um, his mother, being very protective, when he was a baby, dipped him into the river Styx, um, holding him by his uh, his heel. Um, and all, all of him, except for the one place where she held him, that was dipped into the river, became invulnerable. And so he was a very good warrior, because no weapon could harm him. But it turned out he had an Achilles heel. That, that's where the expression comes from. Which was that his, his heel was his weakness. And somebody learned about that, and shot him in his heel and killed him. Um, but anyway, Ethan had wanted to make uh, Achilles in the original Theros. Uh, I think the original card just had protection from three, I think. Um, the idea was that, you know, uh, and Ethan tried to get it in. It was in, the, it was in the file. We handed it off from Vision, or from Design back then. It wasn't Vision Design yet. Uh, we handed it off from, it, it ended up leaving for various reasons. Um, I think Ethan tried to get it in again at Journey to Nyx, because he led Journey to Nyx. Um, but it didn't make it there either. So finally, we tried again, and Ethan changed it up a little bit. This time, uh, randomizing, sort of like, so you don't quite know um, what it has protection from. So your opponent has to sort of figure it out, like, oh, is it two, is it three, is it four? So let, it lets, since you don't quite know what it is, you have to experiment with things to figure out what will work and what will not work. Um, I think it's a secret. Let me take it back. Is it secret or not? Um, no, I guess, I guess the opponent knows whether it's two, three, or four. You just choose it at random. So you, the person playing it, don't get to pick it. Um, but I guess everybody knows what it is once what it is. But that means they then have to find that answer to be able to deal with him. Um, anyway, the card turned out really cool. And I'm glad that Ethan was uh, followed my school of thought of, if you like something, just keep making it eventually. Eventually, it's, they'll let it through. Um, okay. Next. Hero of Nyxborn. So Hero of Nyxborn is one red-white, so three mana total, one of which is red, one of which is white. It's a 2-2 enchantment creature, human soldier. When Hero of the Nyxborn enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 human soldier creature token. And whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero of Nyxborn, creatures you control get plus one plus zero until end of turn. So that ability, the last ability, is basically what the ability heroic was. 
Um, although hero heroic was whenever you were targeted, whenever this creature's targeted, generates an effect. So in this set, there's five cards that essentially have heroic. All of them do the same thing. They're in red and white, two in red, two in white. I think one common red, one uncommon red, one common white, uncommon white, one uncommon red white, which is the red white signature card, the archetype card. And um, all of them grant plus one plus oh until end of turn. We didn't put uh, heroic on them just because there weren't that many of them. They all did the same thing. We did label them all hero of blank. Uh, and like I said, they're in red and white. And so the idea was that uh, it is, um, red, white is the aggro deck. So it, it was a heroic thing that really played into a go wide aggro strategy because it, it pumps your team. Uh, the card that makes you want to build around it, not only does it do that, but it also makes a one, one. So for three men, I get a two, two and a one, one. Um, and so if I target hero just off what I have in the battlefield, forget anything else I have, um, I'm going to hit you for five damage, right? Because I have two, two, they, it becomes a three, two, and the one, one becomes a two, one. Um, next, Clothis, God of Destiny. One red, green. So three mana total, one of which is red, one of which is green. Four, five, legendary enchantment creature, God. Uh, in, indestructible. As long as your devotion red and green is less than seven, Clothis isn't a creature. At the beginning of your pre combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land card, add red or green. Otherwise, you gain two life, and Clothis deals two damage to each opponent. Um, so, uh, one of the things that's kind of funny here is, first off, uh, let me talk about the God of Destiny. So, uh, it's a red-green God. Destiny is very much a green concept. So the idea that the red-green God is the God of Destiny here is not saying that red and green inherently together are the concept of destiny as much as it's a God of Destiny, very green thing, that has a very red outlook on life. Uh, that is very much, uh, has a very, uh, adamant style, you know what I'm saying? So it is it is kind of a character that has red means to get to a green end goal. A lot of times I talk about with multicolor how sometimes one color is the end goal and some is the means. This is a god of fate whose end goal is fate, so end goal is green, but a lot of her methods are red. Um, when, uh, in original Theros, when Xenagos became a god, it was because the red-green god had gone missing, and he, he took her place. Uh, this is the red-green god. She... Was, she's trapped in the underworld, um, and uh, we knew we had to let, let you see her because everybody was all, where was the red green god? What happened to the red green god? So we wanted to show you the red green god. Um, this is obviously designed like the other gods. Um, uh, the one thing is that uh, the other gods are all have static ability, activate ability. She just has an activate ability, but she functions like the other two, two color gods, where the devotion is, of both of them have to add up to seven rather than one, just one color add up to five. So she's, she's modeled after the, uh, the two color gods from original Theros block. Uh, Born of the Godhead, the allies, and Journey Nix had the enemy. Um, anyway, so the idea is um, she's exiling cards from Graveyard, and then one of two things happen. Either um, if it's a land, you're generating mana, and red and green are the two colors that generate mana. Um, or uh, if it's a uh, not a land, uh, you're essentially draining your opponents for two, which is funny because um, we, you saw this before in a red-white card as well. Red does direct damage, and white and green gain life. So red does damage, green gains life. Uh, black can do that by itself as a drain. This technically is not a drain in, from a flavor standpoint. You're just getting two effects, but they are two effects that go together on another color. So uh, apparently, um, I, I think for some reason it's entertaining to us. Uh, to let red, white, and now red, green cards do drain effects because red does damage and white and green gain life. Uh, but anyway, that is the God of Destiny. Okay, next. Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. Black, red, so two mana total for uh, a 6-6, six, six, a legendary creature, Elder Giant. Um, but when Kroxa exits the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. So when you first time you cast it for two mana, it's a 6-6, six, six, but it just goes, it dies right away. Then it says, whenever Krosa enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card. Then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card loses three life. So when you play it and it sacrifice right away, you do generate that effect as well as when you escape it. And then it's escape black, black, red, red, so double the cost to cast it normally, exile five other cards from your graveyard, and then it gets to come out. So the idea is, I play this for two mana, I make my opponent discard a card. Uh, if they can't discard, if they discard it, I'm uh, sorry, um, if they didn't discard a land card, it also makes them lose three life. 
And then I now have a creature that once I've built up four mana and five cards in my graveyard, I get to bring out a 6-6. Six, six. Um, now, uh, the Titans, like I said earlier, I'm sorry, not earlier, I said on a previous podcast, um, uh, that uh, the Titans were something new we added that we hadn't done in original Theros block. Um, the, uh, the, um, we, we were trying to find some new space to play around with, and the Titans are a big part of Greek mythology. Uh, they predate the gods, uh, so we decided that we would do our version of the Titans. Um, Ethan originally made the Titans a, fi- a cycle of monocolor Titans. Um, it turned out that, A, we didn't have space for five, and since they were legendary, it made a little more sense to make them multicolored just to give them a, l- a little more play and maybe make them more exciting commanders. Um, so we ended up making two multicolored ones, um, one of which is Kropsa. I'll get to the other one in a second. Um, they, they, they both have the, the shtick of sacrifice me when you play me, and you can only escape me from the graveyard. The only way to get me into play, really, is escape me. But I haven't entered the battlefield effect. So when you play me th- for the cheaper version, I'm generating an effect. Okay, next. Kunaris, Hound of Aethreos. One white, black. So three mana total, one white, one black. Uh, it's a 3-3 hound, legendary creature. It's got Vigilance, med- Menace, and Lifelink. Uh, creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield, and players can't cast spells from graveyards. Okay, so this is Cerebus. Uh, our, our version of Cerebus, uh, the three-headed dog that guards guards uh, the underworld. So, uh, Athreos is the god of the underworld, or the god that g- guards the underworld, I guess. So he has a dog, three-headed dog, because we're doing, we're, we're doing trope space here. Uh, because the guard has three heads, the dog has three heads, uh, it has three abilities, Vigilance, Menace, and Lifelink. Vigilance, a white ability. Menace, a black ability. Lifelink, a white and ba- black ability. Uh, and then creature cards can uh, in, creature cards and graveyards can't enter the battlefield, and players can't cast spells from the graveyard. So while he's out, he's guarding the, the dog. The, the doggy is guarding his uh, the graveyard, and so Coronas keeps you from getting things away. You can't escape. Well, he's he's guarding. So I think this is pretty flavorful. Mischievous Chimera, blue red. So two mana total for a two two enchantment creature, a Chimera, flying. Whenever you cast your first spell for each turn. Mysterious Chimera, Chimera deals one damage to each opponent, and you scry one. So this is the blue-red uncommon build-around card. Uh, like I said, it's spell-based and wants you to stuff on your opponent's turn. So this rewards you for that by doing a red effect, do one damage uh, to the opponent, and a blue effect, scrying one. So uh, this is just the card that sort of encourages you to do it, uh, but also it's a two-mana, two-two flyer. I mean, it's a pretty efficient card, and if you do what it says, if you generate a lot of the effect, it, it's pretty potent. Okay, next, Pelucanos Unchained. Two black green for a legendary creature, Zombie Hydra. So it's a zero, zero, but Pelucanos enters the battlefield with six plus one, plus one counters on it. It escapes with 12 plus one, plus one counters on it instead. So it's a six, six creature, and when it dies, you can bring it back from the graveyard, not as a six, six, but as a 12, 12. Um, if damage will be dealt to Pelucanos while it has a plus one, plus one counter, a counter on it, prevent that damage and remove that many plus one, plus one counters. So, any damage to it is kind of permanent. So if I'm a 6-6 six, six and you do 4 damage to me, oh, I take 4 damage permanently, now I'm a 2-2. Two, two. Uh, one black green, Pelucanus fights another target creature. And escape, 4 black green, exile 6 other cards from your graveyard. So basically, uh, you get a 4 mana 6-6, six, six, although it's a 6-6 six, six that all damage is, is, is permanent. So it's a little more... Um, it's a little more uh, vulnerable than most, fragile than most. Um, but it also has this fight ability, so um, you can use it. The one thing here is, unlike the ETB fight, this thing really gives something up to fight that you're losing your size based on damage, so you really are losing some creature for the fight, so this feels a little more right for a, uh, a green fight card. Um, also, it's a black green card, not just a green card. Um, but anyway, uh, Pelucanos was a legendary Hydra from the original... Um, Theros, and now it's dead and in the underworld. So that, that's, that's pretty flavorful. Um, and so we wanted to make a really splashy um, Pelucanos, but this time it's an undead Pelucanos, so that's kind of cool. Okay, next. Uh, Siona, Captain of Pileus. One green-white. So three mana total, one of which is green, one of which is white. It's a 2-2 legendary creature, human soldier. When Siona, Captain of the Pileus, enters the battlefield, look at the top seven cards of your library, you may reveal an aura card from among them and put it in your hand. Put the rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. 
And whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a creature you control, create a 1-1 human soldier creature token. So this is an aura lord. It's a white green, it's legendary, it's meant for, um, can be a commander. Um, and the idea is that it both helps you find auras and then re rewards you for playing auras. And so it's like, this wants to be played with lots of auras, you play with a lot of auras and both, it'll help you go get the auras and it will make lots of 1-1 one -one creatures. So, and the reason 1-1 one -one creatures are nice is it just makes more things that you can put auras on. Okay, Slaughter Priest of Mogus, black and red. Uh, creature, Minotaur Shaman, 2-2. Two, two. Uh, whenever you sacrifice a permanent, Slaughter Priest of Mogus gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. 2, sacrifice another creature or enchantment, Slaughter Priest of Mogus gets first strike until end of turn. Okay, so this is, I believe, the black and red build around, uncommon build around. Black and red are all about sacrificing things. Black can sacrifice creatures, red can sacrifice enchantments. Uh, red can also sacrifice creatures. Um, uh, but sacrifice enchantments is something we gave to red in this set. So whenever you sacrifice a permanent, this thing gets bigger. Um, Mogus, by the way, I think is the, uh, one of the gods is a um, minotaur. And so this is a minotaur shaman, but to the minotaur god. And like I said, we, we mentioned all the gods. Uh, some of them are on cards, but all the rest we mentioned through names and flavor text and stuff. Um, the other thing is that this thing can... Um, you can pay to sacrifice uh, a creature enchantment. Like I said, black tends to sacrifice creatures, red sacrifice enchantments. So you can sacrifice either because of the black red card, and then that means you can trigger itself. And when you sacrifice a creature, it gets first strike. So not only does it get plus two plus O oh, because of its static ability, but when you sacrifice a creature enchantment to it, essentially becomes a 4-2 first striker, which, which is a, a pretty scary thing. Next, Uro, Titans of Nature's Wrath. This is the other Titan. It's in green-blue. So uh, one green-blue, three mana total. One, one is green, one is blue. Um, it's a 6-6 six, six Legendary Elder Giant. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice the less it escapes. So same trick as the other one. Uh, when Uro enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life and draw a card. Then you may put a land card from your hand on the battlefield. So it's a very green-blue card. Um, and then escape green-green-blue-blue, blue, exile five other cards. So it's mirrored very much like the other Titan. I think the other Titan costs two mana. This costs three. But other than that... Um, it costs uh, CCDD or MMNN, uh, two colors and two other colors to get to escape it. Um, it has an effect that's generated. You know, it's sacrificed if you don't get it from if you don't escape it. But it, but it has an enter the battlefield effect, so it triggers both times, uh, either if you cast it or escape it. Uh, and then it just becomes this big scary six six. Um, notice that we made we didn't cross over colors because we just did two of them. We did one black red and one green blue. Um, Everybody seemed to think that's some conspiracy against white. I think we just made two that we thought were cool. Uh, we weren't trying to necessarily leave white out, but if you make two two-colored things and don't overlap colors in a five-color game, you're going to miss one. So um, missing white was not on purpose. Okay, next. Warden of the Chained. One red-green. Uh, it's a Minotaur Warrior. It's got Trample. Warden of the Chained can't attack unless you control another creature with power four or greater, and it's a four-four. So it's a three mana, four, four, which is pretty good, but you have to have another four power creature to attack with it. Note that red, green, this is the build around card for red, green and uncommon. Uh, having creatures power four or greater is the theme in red, green. So this thing is kind of like, hey, I'm really good, but you gotta be playing some other four power creatures. Um, and so hopefully you're doing that. Okay, into artifacts. Altar of the Pantheon. So Altar of the Pantheon is an artifact that costs three. It says your devotion to each color and combination of colors is increased by one. Tap, add one mana of any color. If you control a god, a demigod, or a legendary enchantment, you gain one life. Okay, so the idea is, this card started because we wanted to make a card that increased devotion. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that means. Uh, eventually, it, we, it, it turned out, you could just say, hey, hey, your devotion is plus one. Notice we say color or combination colors. It, the goal wasn't to make uh, two color gods have plus two devotion. It's just plus one. If you care about devotion, you're plus one in devotion is the idea. And then for flavor, the idea is, okay, well, if it's going to have to do with devotion, it's probably tied to the gods. Okay, well, what if we give you some reward if you're playing something thematic? And so the idea is, you know, it can add mana of any color, so you want to play just because it adds mana. I mean, it's a three, it's an art, three co a three cost artifact that has for any mana. That's something you might want to play if you're playing two or more colors. And then, for a little extra bonus, a, a little just more flavor than anything, it gives you a life if you have a god, a demigod, or a legendary enchantment. Um, and I think the reason it says legendary enchantment is I'm not sure if gods are gods before they become creatures, if they haven't been turned on yet. 
So that, that we want to make sure that you counter the god. You know, if Heliod's in play, whether or not Heliod's a creature, you still got to count it. So that, that's, that is why it said that. Okay, next. Uh, entrancing Lighter. So this costs three. It's an artifact. Um, you may choose not to not tap. Uh, I'm sorry. You may choose to not untap Entrancing Lighter during your untap step. X tap. Tap target creature with power X or less. It doesn't untap during its control or untap step as long as Entrancing Lighter remains tapped. So the idea here is this is a lighter that plays itself. Um, it's funny because in Throne Eldrain we had a harp that plays itself and end up getting cut. Uh, but that, that trope actually overlaps between Greek mythology and uh, fairy tales. So um, my assumption is it started in Greek mythology because that's older than fairy tales. But anyway, it does overlap between them. The, when Jack goes, there's a self-playing harp. Anyway, um, the idea is this can lock something down so you can... Um, but because locking down things is powerful, it, it's X. So you have, you have to, to lock down larger things, you have to pay more mana. But once you lock it down, you can choose not to untap it and then keep it tapped. Um, this is a mechanic that goes way back. We've been doing this mechanic for a long, long time of locking things and leaving it locked. Okay, next. Nyx Lotus. Four. Legendary Artifacts. Nyx Lotus enters the battlefield tap. Uh, choose a color. Add an amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion to that color. So this is a Lotus that taps for devotion, meaning it taps with that much devotion. Um, this is pretty potent. Um, uh, I... I'm not up in some of the larger formats, but I have to believe, at least in monocolor decks, that this, this card is going to see some play. It's a pretty potent card. Um, but anyway, I, I think we wanted to make some... It, by the way, the way you can tell we think it's powerful is we put Lotus on it. Uh, we do not use the word Lotus. It, it's a pretty potent word that excites our players. Uh, and so, A, it has to reduce mana, because that's what Lotuses do, and multiple mana. Um, but we don't tend to use Lotus in, unless we really think the card is something people are going to like. Um, we made a few mistakes back in the day, so it's not as if we've never, like Lotus Garden should not have said Lotus on it. But um, most of the time now, when you see Lotus, it, it's what we call a power word. It excites people. So um, you know, you're not going to see it without it being something we at least think is going to be exciting. Uh, not guaranteed. It's, it might be something that we think is, is, well, we think it's exciting. I guess it doesn't have to be powerful. Usually, uh, usually it's something that's exciting because partly, it's partly because it's powerful. And making mana is usually good. Okay, next. Shadow Spear. One. Legendary Artifact Equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one as Trample and Lifelink. One. Permits your opponent control. Lose Hexproof and Indestructible at the end of turn. And Equip Two. So this is the spear that um, Elsbeth uses. Uh, it's sort of a nightmare spear. Um, anyway, uh, I don't want to... So, spoilers, but uh, she uses it... Uh, she runs it through a god. So we... Uh, Losing Hexproof and Destructive is, like, we, it is important that you could do what the, the character can do in the story, which is stab a god. And so this is a, uh, a weapon that you can use to address and answer gods. Um, and so a lot of people ask why we didn't make it colored. I don't know. I, I guess the, the thing there was, I think we wanted Elspeth to use it. She's mono-white, but the, the spear itself didn't feel mono-white. And so it, it, I think if we make, for example, just say you make it black, which is kind of what the... What the well, it's also, it gives Trample and Lifelink. Well, huh. Anyway, we wanted Elspeth to have it, and if we made it something that was a certain color, it might be weird that this mono-white card got access to this not-white thing, so we just made it colorless. I think that's why we made it colorless for flavor. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm almost done here. Uh, Thundering Chariot. Um, four, Artifact Vehicle. Three, three. First Strike, Trample, Haste, Crew, one. I think it's the only vehicle on the set. Um... I just the idea of a chariot, you know, we're, we're, we're in Greek time, so we thought it'd be fun to make a chariot. Uh, the idea that it's sort of, it, it's super fast and it can run you over. So first strike and haste are kind of on the fast thing, and then trample's like, oh, it'll run you over. So I, I think that's kind of cool. Um, okay, we're almost done. Um, okay, I, I will finish up with Labyrinth of Skophos. Um, and... Uh, Oh, I went, once again, I went out of order. Or did I? Oh, no, 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 this is, this is a land. This is a land, that's why. It's not out of order. Lands are after artifacts. Okay, but this is my, la this is my, final, my final card of the day. Labyrinth of Skophos. Uh, land, tap for colorless mana. Four and tap, remove target attacking or blocking creature from combat. So this card is making reference to 
um, the labyrinth of of um, the the labyrinth of Greek mythology, where the the one and only Minotaur existed, uh, where Theseus was trapped in it, uh, and the labyrinth. The idea of a labyrinth was people couldn't find their way out. So this is playing in similar space uh, to Maze of Ith, which was another labyrinth, um, which is probably making the same reference. Um, and so, uh, although Maze of Ith, you just tapped, this costs four and tap, so it's costs a little bit more to use. Maze of Ith was a little bit powerful. Um, but anyway, uh, and this is the card that ties to the red, uh, there's a red um, minotaur that if you have them together, then he, fight, he fights the things in the maze. Um, so that, that was, um, that was that. So anyway, we've now made it through all of um, Theros, Theros Beyond Death. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I, I definitely, this was, um, it was a fun set to work on. I like Greek mythology and, and like I said, this is, I got to work on, this is my fourth set based in Theros. So I, I, it's fun. I, I worked on all three of the previous sets. I obviously worked on this set. So I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Uh, I had five of them, so I had plenty to say. So anyway, um, I'm now at work. So we all know that means instead, instead of, uh, I, do we know what that means, Mark? Do we? Uh, we all know what that means, except for me. Uh, it means it's the end of my drive to work. So instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.